If a dog has bitten a person and the animal shelter in California is aware of this information, then the shelter must disclose this knowledge prior to allowing someone to adopt the dog. This is California's new dog bite law. Here are my thoughts about this and my reaction to the prior discussion we had with legal dog bite expert Ken Phillips. Dogs bite. Just because a dog has bitten someone doesn't necessarily mean that dog is vicious or a bad dog or a reason to destroy that dog. Dogs bite when they're protecting their property. Dogs bite trying to protect their owner. They can bite trying to protect themselves or their food or toys. They might bite when they're harassed or provoked. They can bite when they're frightened or scared. I've been bitten by dogs. I was bitten when I picked up an injured dog in the middle of the road. He was bleeding, he had broken bones, and he was scared and in pain. Is that a justified bite? You bet it was. I was bitten by my own dog when we were caught in a situation where my dog was trying to protect me. An unintended, inadvertent bite, I would call it, but it happens. My nephew was bitten by a dog while he was petting a dog. We later found out that the dog had a severe, untreated ear infection, and my nephew touched the dog on his sensitive, painful ear. Does that mean that dog's a bad dog? Should we punish that dog for hurting my nephew? I have a friend whose dog bit a young boy who jumped in the yard to retrieve his basketball. Dog was protecting his property. Do you think that's justified? Should the dog be punished for that? Legally speaking, would the dog be punished for that? So someone relinquishes their dog to the shelter and says, my dog bites. Now the shelter workers in California have to disclose to any potential adopter that this dog bites. Shelter workers should be honest if he or she knows something about the dog's history. They should disclose what they know. I absolutely agree with that. But is it really fair to the dog to simply say, This dog has bitten someone without disclosing the circumstances behind that bite. I mean, by saying this dog bites, you automatically stigmatize that dog. Some people would indeed equate a dog that bites to a vicious dog. If a shelter worker says to you, okay, before you adopt this dog, legally I need to tell you that this dog has bitten in the past. Most everyone, I would imagine, would not want to adopt that dog. If a shelter worker said to me, this dog has a bite history, I'd say, okay, dogs bite. What's the circumstances behind that bite? They would likely say, I don't know, because it's impossible for the truth to be known. But I'm not sure I'd want to adopt that dog either without knowing more information. And you know what happens to that dog? In all likelihood, that dog is deemed unadoptable. And in many U.S. shelters, the dog is destroyed. So, wow. We didn't even know the truth behind the bite, and we didn't even want to give that dog the benefit of the doubt, and yet the dog doesn't have a chance for a home, does he? If I'm told by the school principal that my child punched another kid, I need to know a little more information about what transpired. I don't think my child would just punch a kid for no reason. Was it justified? Maybe my child was being bullied, so he punched the bully. For a shelter to be forced by law to make public that a dog bites without any additional information just seems a little unfair. That's all I'm saying here. And it's impossible for the shelter workers to know the true facts surrounding a dog bite or if the dog even really bit someone. But now in two states, they are forced to pass along and make public any information told to them by anyone about a dog. Say someone relinquishes a dog to a shelter because they say this dog nipped their baby. Now that shelter worker says to a potential adopter, hey, this dog's a baby biter. You know that dog's never going to be adopted. If I heard this, my first thought would be, why is this dog, any dog, allowed to be in close proximity to a baby? What happened? Who's the owner? And where was the owner? Perhaps this dog is not a good fit for this particular family with a baby. Should this one incident make it so the dog loses all chances of getting into a home and becoming part of someone's family? Should we destroy the dog because all we know is that we heard from someone that this dog nipped a baby? I don't know. Do we destroy dogs for nipping babies regardless of the owner's stupidity and the circumstances that led up to the bite? 
Now, from the perspective of the shelter workers, they know if they disclose to a potential adopter that a dog bites, it's very likely the dog will never get adopted. So depending on that shelter's policies, they might automatically deem that dog unadoptable or vicious, and the dog gets killed. I have known, and I've worked with many shelter staff, and despite what some people think, they don't enjoy killing dogs. Most of the shelter workers and rescue groups I've worked with try really hard to match a particular dog with the right kind of family. And that's the key here, isn't it? With any adoption of a dog or a cat to a new home and family, the shelter workers and rescue groups need to take a good history and interview the potential adopter, which not all shelters do. There are some shelters that will adopt out any dog to any person who wants that dog. I know a shelter that adopted an energetic, strong, big puppy who grew to be an 80-pound dog to a 91-year-old man who lives alone. You think that 90-year-old, who depends on a cane, by the way, will be able to adequately socialize and exercise the dog and offer the dog the stimulation that a puppy needs? And what will happen when this big, strong, energetic puppy accidentally hurts the man or pulls the man to the ground on a morning walk? Or what happens to the dog when the 91-year-old dies tomorrow? Not so smart of the shelter worker. And very selfish of the man who wanted a puppy. I mean, what the hell was he thinking? So shelters need to ask questions. Do you live alone? Do you have other pets? Do you have kids? How old are your kids? Have you owned a dog before? If so, what happened to that dog? Did you get your prior dogs fixed or vaccinated? If not, why? Can you afford food for the dog? Where are you going to keep the dog? Tied up in the backyard or home all day while you're working? A lot of information about you and your lifestyle need to be known to assist in making a good match. Generally speaking, shelters and rescue groups want you to be happy with the animal you adopt from them. They want you to be happy with your new family member. They want it to be a lifelong loving home for the animal. They don't want you to return the dog back to them because it didn't work out or the dog wasn't the right fit. Every shelter and rescue group should have a dog adoption questionnaire and an, and an adoption process and spend a little time trying to make a good match. Unfortunately, many of them don't. Recently, Peter and I were walking at the street fair with one of our dogs, Sky. We got Sky from a shelter, and this was not from a no-kill shelter. And she's a pit bull. And yes, our shelters are overwhelmed with pit bulls. The shelter we obtained Sky from, more than 70% of the dogs there were pit bulls or pit bull mixes. Pretty much the rest of the dogs were chihuahuas. So yes, our shelters are overflowing with pits because they're being bred to death, literally. Because we are destroying these particular dogs because there's just too many of them. What a shame. What a shame we breed dogs. What a shame breeders exist. So had we not adopted Skye, she would likely have been killed by the shelter. Anyway, we're at the street fair and we came across a woman with a golden retriever. Oh, they're such nice dogs, aren't they? Much nicer than our vicious pit bulls. Well, this golden retriever was on a leash held by a woman, lunged toward and growled at our Skye. It was obvious the dog wanted to go after Skye. And this woman almost lost hold of her leash when her dog nearly pulled her to the ground when he was lunging. Thankfully, nothing bad happened. This woman scolded her dog and was trying to control him as we quickly scooted in the other direction. And this was a crowded place, so there were many people who observed this incident. And people around us, and we especially, were relieved that what potentially could have been a horrible scene was not. Then a few people sort of chuckled and looked at us and made friendly, joking comments because to them, it was sort of a funny situation to see that a pit bull was almost attacked by a golden retriever because that's the mindset of most people. The pit bull is the bad dog and the golden is the good dog. Let's say the golden retriever did get loose from her owner and attacked our dog. Now there's a dog fight and inevitably someone, dog, human, someone is going to get hurt. So who's liable for any bodily damage either dog does to someone? And how many ways can the story be told and interpreted? I relinquish Sky back to the shelter, hypothetical here, of course, and I tell the shelter workers, my pit bull dog 
bit another dog, a golden retriever, but this golden instigated the entire fight. Do you think the shelter will believe my story? Now that shelter in California is legally obligated to tell the bite history of Skye to any potential adopter. Hey, before you adopt this pit bull, I need to tell you he has a bite history. Oh, what happened? A golden retriever bit this dog, so the pit bull bit him back. Will people believe that? Now, let's say the woman with the golden retriever relinquishes her dog to the shelter because the breeder who she purchased the dog from is not going to take that dog back because breeders don't do that. Breeders breed dogs for profit, and the hardworking shelters and rescue groups are the dumping grounds for unwanted dogs that breeders produce. So this woman takes her golden to the shelter and says, my dog was bitten by a pit bull. Aha! Now that's a believable story. How would you define a dangerous dog? I do believe there are dogs that are dangerous. Is it the dog's fault the dog is dangerous or vicious? He or she wasn't born vicious because all dogs are good dogs. It's always the owner who made the dog into a bad dog or a vicious dog. But what's the definition of vicious anyway? Vicious might have its own legal definition. But it seems to me that the definition of vicious or dangerous is purely subjective, right? I mean, what I think is a vicious dog might be different than what you think is a vicious dog and different than the person who was attacked by a dog when she was a child thinks is a vicious dog. In addition, maybe that dog's only dangerous in a given situation or environment or around certain kinds of people. We had a wonderful dog, Paco. Paco didn't like people who spoke the Spanish language. Paco was not a dangerous dog. Paco was not a racist dog. But we just made sure that the Spanish language was not spoken around Paco. And I'm just assuming Paco was abused by a person who spoke Spanish. And that's the point. If you know a dog is not comfortable in a given situation or environment, and or you do not approve of the dog's behavior in a given environment or around certain people or other dogs, you might have to make some adjustments in your lifestyle to keep your dog and your family and everyone around you safe and happy. It's not hard, maybe a little inconvenient, but so what? That's life, and that's what you do. So, we're talking about the definition of a dangerous dog. Purely subjective. And you know, even shelters have their own definition of a dangerous dog. A lot of shelters have what's called temperament testing to determine if dogs are dangerous or vicious in certain situations. And other shelters don't use any sort of method of testing or evaluation. They might deem a dog vicious by the dog's bite history or whatever random indiscriminate means they choose. And not all shelter employees are experienced with dog behavior. And you might just be dealing with a scared dog who was recently picked up off the streets and who was lost from his home. And that dog might very well cower in the corner or growl at anyone who enters his kennel. Or maybe the dog was in an abusive situation and, again, might not want to trust or be kind to you or any human initially. Are these vicious dogs? No, they're scared. And they're certainly not going to do well on any temperament test or any sort of evaluation given by a complete stranger. My own dogs, if lost from me and picked up and thrown into a loud, scary shelter cage, would likely fail any tests and might very well be deemed vicious or dangerous. And realistically, who's going to want to adopt a dog who is labeled vicious anyway? Yeah, the dog is probably not vicious by your standards, but you're not going to want to adopt that dog. And you certainly have to question the motives of the adopter who wants to adopt a dog labeled as vicious. What's he going to do with that dog? Use him as a fighting dog? Sell him to a research lab? I don't know. But the thing is, for the most part, from my experience... Shelters don't adopt out dogs that they think are truly vicious. And it boils down to what your definition of vicious is. I know there are exceptions, okay? But I don't see shelters adopting out dogs that they think will turn around and hurt other people or animals. Now, having said that, there have been a few instances I'm aware of where dogs should not have been released to the public at the time they were. I'm not saying these dogs were vicious. What I'm saying is more training or socialization or rehabilitation should have been offered to that dog. 
and then reassessed, establishing this dog is okay to be adopted out to a given person or family. And by the way, this is an entirely different topic we can talk about another time, but earlier in the show, the term no-kill shelter was mentioned. And you might know this already, but just because a shelter claims they are no-kill doesn't mean they never kill a dog. I know it might sound like a misleading term if a shelter describes itself as a no-kill shelter and they kill a dog, but some shelters might say they are no-kill, and that usually means they strive for that, okay? I mean, they might be situations where they do kill a dog. Like if a dog is suffering and essentially untreatable, like a dog was hit by a car and has internal bleeding and broken bones and barely breathing, of course, any humane shelter would euthanize that dog. Now that's the real definition of euthanasia, by the way, taking an individual out of its misery. Now, I will tell you that what often happens in these no-kill shelter settings, since they strive not to kill animals unless they have to, unfortunately, you get some dogs and cats there in that shelter for a very long time, and they can develop extreme kennel stress and anxiety from their lengthy stays. Just like any individual cooped up in a small place with little stimulation for a long time will go a little stir-crazy. Again, this doesn't make the dog a dangerous dog. So what's the bottom line? Our country still has millions of homeless dogs and cats that are in need of a loving forever home. We are still killing millions of unwanted animals in our shelters every year. Don't buy a dog from a breeder, okay? If you're wanting to add a dog or a cat to your family, consider visiting your local shelter. Check out the animals just waiting there to be a part of your family. And if you end up adopting from a shelter, in all likelihood, you'll be saving a life. And that's a good thing. And dogs bite. And let's not conflate a dog that bites with a vicious or dangerous dog. My parents' little 12-pound rescued Maltese chiclet would bite certain individuals who would approach my mother. Is Chiclet a vicious dog? No, little fluffy white Chiclet is not a vicious dog and would never be labeled vicious. But if my mother had a pit bull and that same person approached her and the pit bull was trying to protect my mother, that's a different story. That dog's vicious. And we all know why this is the case. Number one, larger dogs can do more damage when they bite than smaller dogs, just on the basis of their size of their mouth and teeth. And number two, pit bulls have a bad rap. And that's because many people are misinformed about pit bulls. Given the same situation and under the same circumstances, why are certain dog breeds automatically deemed vicious and others are not? Two little dogs the size of a large rat have bitten the nose of one of our large dogs minding his own business. Who's the vicious one? Maybe no one. Dogs bite. A woman asked her veterinarian, is there any chance my dog will bite someone? The veterinarian's response was, does it have teeth? 